I felt I had been walking around dead for 33 years. And I felt for the first time that I came alive. I got to believe what God said in his word. And if we really believe what God said in his word, my friend, we will see change and transformation. Welcome to Pacific Art of Mission. One of the most exciting things about being here is seeing what God can do in the life of a man or a woman. Think about it, when they walk through our doors absolutely hopeless, nowhere to go, and they walk through these doors of hope. To see them come to Christ and to see what God can do in their lives and put the pieces back together, to see men that were, some of them formerly addicts, estranged from their family, now fully functioning followers of Christ, engaged in society again. Some have rekindled those relationships. See what God has done has been absolutely amazing. So I want you to stay tuned and open your heart to see these stories of life change. One of the most amazing stories for us is everybody that's a part of this television ministry, except myself, at one time has been homeless. They've walked through these doors needing help and now here they are telling their stories for you so you can see what God is doing. So open up your hearts. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Phil, and welcome inside Pacific Garden Mission. Many people want to know what happens at Pacific Garden Mission. Yes, we are a shelter and we are a gospel rescue mission, but it's much more than that because inside of Pacific Garden Mission, Jesus Christ is changing lives every day here. People are being made whole, they're being healed, they're being delivered from alcohol and substance abuse. It's powerful what's going on here. And one of the reasons we developed this program for you to watch was to encourage you and to show you what Jesus Christ is doing every day here at Pacific Garden Mission. So many of our staff members were transformed here. I'm one of them at Pacific Garden Mission and they studied the Word of God and their mind came into agreement with the new spirit in them and their lives were changed. And not only that, but the lives around them were changed. Their whole future changed because of Jesus Christ. We want that for you too. And we want to encourage you. If you're struggling with an addiction, when you hear these testimonies, I know you'll want help too. The testimonies we're featuring in today's program are men that went through the New Day program for alcohol and substance abuse. Their lives have been changed. You know, I talked to a man just the other night and he was uh, waiting to meet a counselor and he said, I've tried every program there is and nothing's helped me. Nothing could stop me from drinking. It's been years and I can't quit drinking. Well, these two men both have been set free and made whole. And I know when you hear their testimonies of what Jesus Christ has done in their lives, you'll be encouraged. And we'd love to start with Ian. I was laying in my bed after smoking probably about $200 worth of crack in one sitting. I had a fifth of cheap whiskey next to me and I was coming down because I ran out of money, I ran out of drugs. I, I was in so much pain. I, I, I wanted to die. I just, I wanted to die. I said, if I have to kill myself, I don't care. I wanted to die. And then I, you know, and then I thought about going to hell. Well, if you kill yourself, you go to hell. So now I have an eternity of feeling like this, crying, sweating from, you know, from all the drugs and screaming out. And then something came into me. And I remember laying on my bed and I just, I cried out to God. I said, God, Please take this pain away. I can't bear this pain. Please take it away. And God heard my prayer. I told him I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Either take this pain or take my life. And God heard my prayer. And I gave him everything. 
and all the pain was instantly gone. Just gone. And it was replaced with peace and joy and strength. I felt I had been walking around dead for 33 years. And I felt for the first time that I came alive, where I had been trying to do everything on my own. As soon as I gave it to him, he took everything and made my heart light. The more I learn about what Jesus came here to show us, that God loved the world, God loved me. My, my father did a 90-day program. I'm here doing a 90-day program, a faith-based 90-day program. My father did a 90-day program that was not faith-based. And for 10 years, he was sober, but he was a dry drunk. And He went back to drinking at some point, and a couple of years later, he died from it. And that's because he didn't have the power and the Holy Spirit behind him. And since coming here, that spirit is moving here. I hope that anybody who is listening to me right now, I hope with all my heart that you will feel this, will experience this, and will know this. It's amazing. It will transform you too. It's so exciting to hear a man like Ian surrender and be set free. Happens here all the time. And during these classes in the New Day program, 90 days, they're learning what the root of the substance abuse or alcoholism was. And they discover that and Jesus Christ, of course, continues to set people free. We'd like to share John Gentry's testimony next. My name is John Gentry Sr. I grew up in a good Christian home. Christian parents, had four sisters, I uh, went to private schools. Uh, actually, I dropped out of school in ninth grade and uh, my parents talked me into getting a GED. I went to Bob Jones where I met my wife, which is a blessing. We've been married 23 years, have three kids. Um, joined the Marine Corps the next year. And that's when things started uh, going downhill. Started drinking a lot, uh, multiple deployments. I think I used alcohol to deal with the stress. Um, after the Marine Corps, became a federal agent with the Department of Justice and uh, sort of did the good old boy system again, started drinking, and God shut that door. And uh, we moved back to Kentucky, actually. I became a cage fighter. I've always, I've always enjoyed it, had my own school, and uh, had a couple injuries and uh, a couple surgeries. Doctors started prescribing Percocet, and I got to the point where they said you don't need them anymore, but physically you needed them. So. Yeah, got to be a habit about $120 a day. So it really, it slid downhill. I went from a four bedroom home, a double garage, 17 acres. And I was sleeping on the streets of Lexington for a little bit, just strung out. I'm a big hunter. I love deer hunting and stuff. And a guy, he let me uh, use a gun. It's a thousand dollar weapon. And I cite all his weapons in because I was at the sniper school in the Marine Corps. And, uh, he let me borrow it. I went and pawned it for $400. I got like, put some gas in the truck, got $350 for the park set. It lasted me like two days. And I was like, I remember going to a van in the garage and doing them. I just felt so guilty. I remember talking that night with my wife. She was like, I told her, I said, I, uh, I wish God would give me a sign. And this guy calls me out of the blue saying, uh, the FBI wants that gun. And I was just, I was terrified. 
I said, well, I think that's my sign. We went and got out of pond uh, when we came up here. But yeah, that was my lowest point because I was pretty much stealing. But my wife kept praying for me, and uh, that's how I ended up here. We, would do, we still did devotions. No matter how bad I got, we did devotions at night. We listened to Charles Stanley. And then I started looking at some of the YouTube videos of PGM. I'm like, well, I'm not the only one. So, yeah, we drove seven hours here about a month ago. It was time. I was just broken. My kids didn't trust me. My wife didn't trust me. I was like, I'm 44. I need to do something about this. So, yeah. It's kind of like boot camp in the Marine Corps, except the Bible. That's what I think. It's kind of neat. I don't know. But I really, yeah. I'm enjoying it. I'm learning a lot. The biggest thing is you learn you're not alone. And you don't have to let your, I don't know, all the mistakes you, you made really have to define you. You, know, you can still, I'm 44, but I've still got things to do. So I'm happy to be here. And coming off all those drugs and you start thinking right and, it's amazing how it'll, it'll cloud your judgment. I thought nobody knew what was going on. Everybody knew. Because my wife, we drove up here that seven hour trip, she started telling me all this stuff, and I was like, oh my word. Wow. And now I'm talking to my wife about uh, you know, going back to college, for Clear Creek for Bible College. Mm -hmm. I mean, all this stuff I've been through, I mean, I could witness people like yep. in prisons or things like that. I think that's where my calling is. Some 220 pound tattooed marine come in there. Yeah, I was addicted to this. I went through it, but you know, you don't have to. You don't have to go through it. But you can get set free. If I can do it, anybody can do it. And oh my goodness, I couldn't imagine. Every day, literally every day for five years, I got high. Every day. If I didn't have the money, I'd steal it, or I'd come get it from you. There's hope. If I can go through all that and make it, I mean, I'm nothing special. I hope you are challenged and inspired by the testimonies you just watched because they're real. It's what Jesus Christ is doing here all the time. Many of us who walked through these doors at Pacific Garden Mission felt it was the end of the line. And for most of us it was. There was no other options we had. Uh, people who come here, it's their last program. The next step is maybe death or jail or a mental institution. Yet Jesus Christ is here waiting for everyone who wants to be delivered and set free. Maybe you're watching the program right now and you need help, call the number on your screen or come through these doors. We'll be glad to help you with the love of Christ. He's waiting for you. And if you'd like to help us, remember the people that walk through these doors, it might be the end of the line for them. There's no other program. There's nothing else that works. They come to Pacific Garden Mission. They receive Jesus Christ as our savior. They're set free and hundreds are involved at the mission at this point in time, whether they're alumni members or staff members. It's an opportunity just to show you what Jesus Christ is doing here if you want to stop by. And we'd love to have you help us. Would you go to our secure website right now and look at it. We accept no government funding. Everything is done here for, through the people that see what we're doing at Pacific Garden Mission. Those that want to be involved in a real life today and transform that life and then spend all eternity with Jesus Christ and that person whose life you've changed. We're excited that you'd go to our website right now. It's a secure website. You can give a one-time gift or a monthly recurring gift. And I know you'll be blessed as you do because you're not giving to the mission, you're giving through the mission to the people that need it the most. And we invite you to stop by for a tour. Come by and see what God is doing here on a Saturday. You can take a tour, you can watch the uh, live radio drama Unshackled, which airs across the country. Then you can stay for a dinner in our cafeteria and then you'll be invited to the praise and testimony service where the sermon next will be preached. And there's a testimony every Saturday night of what Jesus Christ has done in someone's life. I know you'll love that experience, so come and visit us on a Saturday. Meet me, meet Pastor Phil, meet some of the people you've seen on this program, and I know you'll be blessed. And then you might wanna go ahead and come by and volunteer. You can make beds upstairs, you can serve a meal in our large cafeteria. You can get to know some of the people in the Bible program, sit out in this courtyard or in one of our libraries and talk to the people in our programs and get to know them and find out how you can get involved in their lives. We love for people to come alongside us and disciple to help us out. We need your support and we value it too. And may God bless you and keep you as you think all this over and pray about it. The name of this message is simple, it's 
healed, but still not whole. And there's a distinction there between being healed. You, you know, when, when Chase gave his testimony, it's really the testimony that I hear from so many people that when they initially come here, they get quote-unquote healed for whatever it was that brought them through these doors. And many times we focus on our outward situation, wh whether it's an addiction or an employment situation or a domestic situation, whatever it is, we focus on that issue. And, and once we think that issue is quote-unquote healed, we want to go back immediately but then we yet don't realize that we're still not made whole. Because hear me tonight, there, there, there's a lot more that goes on inside of us than just the outward activity. I was reading this article out of the New York Times and I just wanted to read the first paragraph. And the name of the article is Healing Physically Yet Still Not Whole. This lady wrote this, this article, listen to this first paragraph. Still haunted and chastened by the Puritan work ethic, our culture doesn't much believe in convalescing and full recovery. No matter what happens in our lives, a grave illness, a wrenching divorce, a death in the family, the unspoken understanding is that we should want to rush back into the game. Like an old-time quarterback who has had one concussion too many, we are expected to stagger back onto the field no matter what. And, and I really thought about the wisdom of that statement, and that's how it is for many of us. Some of us tonight and last week, we talked about offenses. Some of us have been the victims of a horrific divorce, ripped our guts apart, saw our family and children torn apart. So some of us have been beaten in relationships, some of us have been abused and hurt, violated by people that declared their love to us. I, a few weeks ago, told a story about a man who was here when he wrote in his testimony how at the age of 12, his own mother injected him with a needle, a meth needle. Now, now these are some issues that some of us in this room may have struggled with at one point. And yes, we can have a moment where we are healed or we come to Jesus and we make our peace with God, but yet we're still not whole. And to rush back into the battle, to get back into the game, to run back out there and engage with people that have hurt us and wounded us, we need a process where not only are we healed, but we really need to become whole. It's not just focusing on the outward issue when I first came to Jesus, I always thought that as long as I stopped doing certain things in terms of activities, everything would be fine. Then after a while, when you stop doing certain things, you realize it wasn't the activities. I need to work on some stuff in here. I have some issues I have to deal with. And there's some men and women in this room tonight. You need some real healing in your heart. You, you, you really, before you engage back in the game again, you, you need to be made whole. This body, that's mind, that's soul, that's spirit. With that in mind, look, if you would, to Luke chapter 17 and verse 11. We see in verse 11, It came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men which were lepers, which stood afar off. Now leprosy was one of the most hideous diseases known to mankind. Let, let me read quickly to you. William Barclay describes the hideous progression of the worst form of the disease. Listen to this here. It might begin with little nodules that go on to ul ulcerate. The ulcers develop a foul discharge. The eyebrows fall out. The eyes become staring. The vocal cords become ulcerated. And the voice becomes hoarse and the breath wheezes. The hands and feet always ulcerate. 
slowly the sufferer becomes a mass ulcerated growths. The average course of this kind of leprosy is nine years, and it ends in mental decay, coma, and ultimately death. Leprosy might begin with the loss of all sensation in some part of the body. The nerve trunks are affected, the muscles waste away, the tendons contract until the hands are like claws. There follows ulcerations of the hands and feet. Then comes the progressive loss of fingers and toes until in the whole, the hand or the whole foot may drop off. The duration of that kind of leprosy is anything from 20 to 30 years. It is a kind of terrible progressive death in which a man dies by inches. They were set aside. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about lepers in the book of Leviticus, and I'll just read it to you from chapter 13. And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent and his head bare, and he shall put a covering upon his upper lip and shall cry, Unclean! Unclean! All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone without the camp, shall his habitation be. Shunned by family, by society, everybody that they knew. Imagine an individual that was involved in regular life, culture, and society. All of a sudden he becomes a leper. He can't talk to his children anymore. He can't go around if he has to be somewhere at a distance in the public. He had to cry out, unclean, unclean, don't go near me. It was absolutely miserable. The alienation, the ostracization, the, the pain, the humiliation. And there you are as a leper. You know, some of us, when we look at our lives, we were miserable. Amen? We may have not been lepers, but spiritually, nobody wanted to be around us, and we didn't want to be around anybody else. Alienated from friends and family. But these men here, when they see Jesus, they cry out, and it says in the text in verse 12, they stood. Afar off is what lepers would do. They would stand afar off. And they see Jesus here, and it says, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now, now understand this, their condition led them to a point of desperation that while they were desperate, they came to Jesus. And there's some of us here tonight, and hear me, our condition has led us to the point of where we are because we would not be engaged or carrying a Bible or talking about God or Jesus on a, on a warm May evening in the city of Chicago. But it's something happened. Our condition led us to desperation. We had nowhere else to turn and nowhere else to go. And what they do is they, they don't cry out and ask for healing. They just ask for what? Mercy. Mercy and whatever that means. Have pity on us. I don't know what that is, but they're just asking for mercy. Look at verse 14. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. Now that may be an interesting statement, but again, quickly, if you... Write the scripture down. Leviticus chapter 14 and verse 2 says, This shall be the law of the leper. In the day of his cleansing, he shall be brought into the priest. So the priest had to declare a leper cleansed. So Jesus doesn't engage them outside of saying, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it says right here, And it came to pass as they went. I believe what Jesus wanted to do from them is exact a little faith. I, I think of the man that was by the pool of Siloam where Jesus told him to get up. A man that's paralyzed for years, you tell him to get up. Really? A man with a withered hand and you tell him to stretch forth thy hand. It's withered. Really? Sometimes God gives us a command 
because he wants to see where our obedience lies if we will listen. And the command might not make a whole lot of sense. Go and show yourself to the priest because going to the priest tells you that you're cleansed and we're ten lepers out here. We asked you to have mercy. And you say, go to the priest? But it says, what did they do? They went. What is it tonight that God is trying to speak to you about that doesn't make a whole lot of sense? God is trying to speak to you in a very unique way because He wants to see what your response is. What is the level of your sincerity? Where is your heart at? Go, go to the priest and it says there, as they went, they were what? Uh, again, just, just imagine that for a moment. If you've been shunned from family and friends, you, you've possibly seen appendages, uh, parts of your body fall off. Your, your voice have, has grown hoarse. You, you're, you're covered in rags. And I'm sure as they were going to the priest, the one looked, hey, look, look at your skin. Look, look my, my, my fingers again, my, my toes, my, my hands. I, 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 I can't believe this. All of a sudden now their, their skin became whole again and they only became whole as they went. Now I believe if they would have stood there still and questioned Jesus, if they would have not moved and said, well, why do we got to go to the priest? We're not cleansed. Why do we got to go to this? You know how far the priest is away? They, they want to get in a debate. They would have stayed where they were. But sometimes God is trying to tell you something, and he wants to see if you initially will obey. And as they were obeying and listening, they were cleansed. Look at this, that's, an, that, that, that's, that's amazing. Now, the ten got what they came for. They asked for mercy. Oh, God gave them mercy. God gave them healing. But the main part of the story is down a little further, verse 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice, what did he do? And I like that, not only with the voice, but with the what? Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Glory! I mean, if you were a leper and your par body parts were falling off, you couldn't see your own children, be around your own family, and now with the prospect of reuniting with society again, and with feet that can walk and hands that can touch, and you, could, you would say, glory! But he stopped his forward progress, and he wanted to go back. He wanted to go back, because that's where it happened. Again, look at this over here. Verse 16, and he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Now we know according to John 4, 9, the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans, and I believe that's why that's listed there, who he was. But the nine went back to their daily lives. Whatever it was, they went to the priest. You don't hear from them again. They got what they came for. And, and here's, here's the point. And sometimes we get what we come for. Oh, I, I, I want to have my marriage put back together again. I want my, my, my wife or my husband to accept, accept me in the home again. I want to be drug free. I don't want to drink anymore. We have these things and we come to Jesus for them. And then we go away because we got what we came for. But we're missing the larger point is God wants to do something inside of your heart. It's only those issues that led you to Him. And now that you are at Him, you have a choice. The nine walked away, went back to their daily life. Everything was great. They got what they came for and they were gone. But one of them came back. And I love this here. He fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. Jesus, thank you. Th th thank you for what you've done in my life. Verse 17, and I again love the interaction here. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? Well, where are the nine? 
That's a probing question. What where are they? Weren't there others that were set free? Weren't there others that were delivered? Weren't there other marriages that were put back together? Weren't there others that were in the grip of bondage and addiction? Weren't there others that were set free come, uh, from incarceration that while you were in jail, you cried out to God and said, God, if you get me out of here and give me favor in the eyes of the judge, I will serve you. And God delivered. You got out. You got set free. And come Sunday morning, where are you? Where are you? Somewhere in the midst of darkness and despair in a relationship and you cried out, Oh God, deliver me this once. And He did. Where are you? Well, where did the nine go? They went back to their daily life and only one turned around and came back and Jesus asked the question. And He says again right here, verse 18, and they are not found that returned to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith has made thee what? Whole. Oh. Oh. Hallelujah, I love that. The ten were cleansed, but one was made whole. You see, what is God that wants to do? He wants to make us. There's some of you here tonight, hear me. God wants to make you whole. There's been wounds in your heart. There's been scars that you've been carrying. There's memories you cannot let go. Last week we talked about bitterness and unforgiveness that you have yet not dealt with. And just by coming temporarily and being set free from a certain vice doesn't change anything because God still wants to deal with the real issues that caused those problems in the first place. Amen. You need to be made whole. And that's what he's saying there. Again, when I, when I think about this, sometimes a crisis leads us to seek answers, does it not? But when we get relief, many times we go back to the people that we were before. I think of Exodus 8.8, 8, talking about Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat Jehovah, entreat the Lord, that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice unto the Lord. But when Pharaoh saw that there was, there was a respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had spoken. See, even Pharaoh said initially, Oh, Lord, uh, Lord, I, I, I acknowledge you and I pray that you would take these away. And sometimes what we don't want is the consequences of our action. Do you hear me? He didn't want the frogs. He didn't want the lights. He didn't want the darkness. But he really didn't want God. And there's some of us, we don't want the consequences of our behavior. And then when we get a moment of respite, we cry out to God, oh God, please. And as I said when I began, I do believe that's why sometimes, and again, there's nothing wrong with it coming back a second, third, or fourth time, because sometimes we think when we're here, we got it. I, I got what I came for. I, I got set free, and, and God, you dealt with this issue, and he did. But then when you go back out there, you're not ready to re-engage it because you're still not made, made whole. And then you got to come back and deal with the inner part. Who am I? And when then I see me for who I am, I realize the ugliness and the anger and the frustration and the bitterness. And I think about the issues and the injustices and all these other things. And God says, now I really want to take a scalpel to your heart and deal with the real heart issues. Yes, you've been healed, but you need to be made whole. Just because a moment of crisis occurred, don't go back. Amen. Fall down at his feet. One of my favorite verses is Luke 2.52, and the Bible says, And Jesus advanced in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Now think about that. Jesus advanced in wisdom. It's intellectual. Stature, physical. Favor with God, spiritual. And man, social. If you really want to be made whole, 
He wants to deal with you intellectually, physically, spiritually, and socially. He wants you whole in body, mind, and spirit. There's some of us, we may be doing a little better in body because we're not abusing it like we were, but are we fine in our soul and in our mind? Are you made whole yet? Well, I was thinking also when I was looking back at this story here, what is the issue of wholeness? How did this man deal with? with becoming whole. Real quick, he had an attitude of wholeness. It was his attitude. It says there again that he fell down and turned back and he gave glory to God. Verse 15. And with a loud voice, what did he do? Look at his attitude. Now, now who are we talking about? A man that was a leper. A man that was shunned by society. A man who felt their cold stares. A man that nobody wanted to be around and now he comes back to Jesus and he's healed and he glorifies God. What was contributed to his wholeness? It was his attitude. He gave glory to God. You know, I, I, I think of Joseph in Genesis 50 verse 19. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye sought evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. My friend, when we think of the issues that have happened to us, he didn't get all caught up in the why. He gave God the glory. When Joseph was confronted with his brothers, he didn't get bitter. He didn't seek revenge. Some of us are still angry about situations that have happened in our life instead of getting an eternal God perspective. Yes, what may have happened was wrong, but like Joseph, what you meant for evil and what they did was evil, it was vile, it was wrong, it was disgusting, but what they meant for evil, my God can turn around and use it for good to His ultimate glory. I'm not going to walk around bitter. I'm not going to walk around angry. I'm not going to walk around frustrated. I'm going to walk around and give glory to the God of heaven. Yes, may I may have been sick, but glory to God. And injustice happened to me. I'm going to praise Him because what they meant for evil, my God meant for good. Hallelujah. I think of uh, Lazarus in John eleven four, 4, but when Jesus heard it, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified thereby. Do you know God wants to be glorified through your story? Maybe there's some things that have happened to you. Instead of getting bitter, I want to get better. I want to use my story because I want to help somebody else that is going through the same thing that I've been through. This man didn't come back to Jesus and say, man, you know, why did I, how come I was a leper? Why did I have to wear rags all those years and I walked down the street and people ran the other way? Why was it me? How come I couldn't see my family? How come I couldn't see my children? Why did all, no, he didn't do any of that. What did he simply do? Glory to God. Glory to God. And what some of us need to do tonight is get alone somewhere. And I know it's hard in a building with a lot of people. Just give glory to God. God, thank you that you've given me another day. Thank you that you've allowed me to see tomorrow. Thank you for your goodness and grace. What contributed to this man being made whole was his attitude. Also, not only attitude, but attentiveness. What I also liked about this in verse 16, and he fell down on his face at his feet. Listen, he placed himself in a position where Jesus can speak to him. Attentiveness, what does that mean? There's so many of us, we really don't want to hear what anybody else has to say. When you, when you read through the book of Proverbs, you hear many times, fools despise wisdom and instruction. I was talking to somebody Monday, and I was talking about, talking about people who change. And I say the difference is, I believe, between the ones who change and the ones who don't are the ones who change have a willing heart to receive reproof. You, you, you could take them, and I remember there was a guy here. I, I pulled him alongside, and I, I told him some very difficult things with tears in his eyes. He said he was frustrated, but the next day he came and he said, thank you because faithful are the wounds of a friend. 
because I needed to hear that. Do you really hear what other people are saying? Are you in a position really to be spoken to? Maybe my personality or maybe some of these issues I've brought upon myself. Jesus, I sit at your feet. I lay here with my face to the ground and I ask you. And and I love the position he's in. He's with his face to the ground. Remember a few weeks ago we looked at the prodigal son? And it says when he was in want, we looked at that, he joined himself to a citizen of the country. But later on when he fed the pigs, the Bible says then he came, what? See, a lot of us are in want, but we've not come to ourself yet. And I really believe true wholeness happens when we come to our self. That's why even at this mission, sometimes a parent will call me and they say, listen, I have a son, he's wild, I, he needs to get on your New Day program. Well, the fact that you're calling for him shows me he's not ready yet. Because when I'm ready, I don't care what i got to do, I'm done. I'm done. You see, you, see, you might be in want but I still have not come to myself. This man was on his face, and he was in a position, God, would you please tell me about myself? Jesus, would you please speak to me? I, I, I'm open, I'm here. The wise man will receive instruction. True wholeness comes by our attitude, an attitude of praise and giving God glory, no matter what happened to us in the past, because God could turn around evil and for good. True wholeness happens when I'm attentive, where I'm in a position where I can listen to God. And I've always known as a pastor, many times you hear a message, and people always think that's good for such and such. Sometimes you hear, hear a, uh, give a message on marriage. And the husband will come up afterwards and they'll say, man, my, I, I wish my wife was here. Man, I'm talking to you. That, that, that's for you. The wife will say, I wish that guy was here. That's how a lot of us are. You know, you know one, one gentleman, and, and, and some of you know what I'm talking about. I, I think of Pastor McNeil. If you ever met with Pastor McNeil, right, Rose, Emmett? He gives it to you straight. A lot of people don't like it. They'll come out and they'll, man, I don't like that guy. I don't like him. Well, loud mouth, who do you think he is? All that stuff. And I'll say, is what he told you true? Well, yeah, it's true. Guy left his wife, smoked up her bank account, right, had an affair, sat down with the pastor, and he said, man, that's, you're a buzzard. How he call me a buzzard? Well, leaving your wife and smoking up the bank account and having a child with another woman is not your wife. What kind of, well, that's a buzzard action, okay. <laughs> Instead of getting mad, maybe we need to listen. See, the one who doesn't change wants to fight. I don't like this person. I don't like that sermon. I don't don't like this. I don't like that. Instead, we fight against it. We fight. But that's why the Bible says fools despise wisdom and instruction. That's a fool despises instruction. He doesn't want it. I'm not talking no more. Why? Because maybe what they're telling you is true. This guy was in a position. How did he become whole? He was at the feet of Jesus with his face into the ground. He was in a position to hear. Friend, are we in a position to hear tonight? God, even if it's about myself, no matter how ugly it is, I want to hear. I want to be the person that you want me to be. I I want to give you praise. I want to give you glory. How also was this man made whole? Also by his action. Again, verse 19. And he said unto him, Arise, Go thy way, thy what? Thy faith hath has made thee whole. That's the means. Was the means of his wholeness was his faith. We can just buzz right through that and say amen, but think about that. I was telling somebody this week about last week when I talked about offenses and forgiving, and they just said, wow, that's hard because, so what you're telling me is we really got to do what the Bible says? Yeah. That's called faith. See, what I want to do when somebody offends me, I want to offend them back. I could talk about praise the Lord, Jesus. I want to offend them back. I don't like that guy. I want to give him evil for evil. I want to ignore my brother at Thanksgiving Day because I can't stand him. I want to ignore this person. I want to go ahead and see them, that other person, get what's coming to them. That's what I want to see. But you're telling me i got to pray for those who use me? You're telling me i gotta, I got to do good? 
to somebody that's done evil to me? You mean I got to forgive that husband, that wife, that relative? I got to forgive them from my heart? Yeah. You know what that's called? Faith. I, I got to believe what God said in His Word. And if we really believe what God said in His Word, my friend, we will see change and transformation. It's amazing. Just, uh, just a few weeks ago, and my, my, my son Michael was with me, we were uh, pulling into the parking lot at the train station. This guy comes out of nowhere. Just, I'm just, you know, you, you, you pull in, you back up. Pull in, he goes right in front of me. And he starts like cursing and flaying his hands. And I was just, I don't know, I don't know this dude. You know, you know, somebody just goes, I'm thinking, and he's just angry. So I'm sitting there, and I could, so I had to finagle, I had to, I had to get around, and I, I, I put, and he pulled right next to me. And then, uh, and so I get out of my car, you know, I'm not, I wasn't afraid, so I, I knock on his window, he's sitting there. I just said, hey, I said, I said, you don't got to curse at me, was there an issue, was there something going on? I said, if you got something, he said, man, he said, I'm just having a bad day. He said, there's some stuff going on at my house. He said, I'm, I'm sorry. I was having a bad day. And then the next day, he pulled up to me, and he, and he said, roll your window down. I said, what's up? And he said, uh, he said man, I want, I want to thank you for what you said yesterday because I thought about it the whole, the whole day, and you were right. Thank you. And it's one of those lessons I'm with my son. I can say, yes, son, you see, that's how it works. <laughs> a soft answer turned to a rest. Now, he, if he would have cursed at me when he rolled down his window... I can't say what I would have done, but since it ended up well, amen. But the point is sometimes we, I got to go by faith. I got to believe what God says in his word. A soft answer turns away wrath. Do I believe that? Do I really believe when somebody's ignorant with me? Do I really believe when somebody has it in for me? Do I really believe when somebody has done me wrong? Do I really believe when injustice has occurred that I have to pray for those that have used me? That a soft answer turns away wrath. Do I really believe that? Oh, your faith has made you whole. And that's what made this man whole. He believed what Jesus said. And we have to challenge ourselves. Do I really believe what God said in His Word? So my friend, as we close today, what was His means of wholeness, His attitude? He gave God the glory. His attentiveness, He was in a position to listen to Jesus. And His action, <laughs> He really did believe what God said. And I'll close with this. I remember the story in John chapter 5 when Jesus was, saw that man by the pool laying there. John 5, 6, when Jesus saw him laying, he knew that he had now been a long time in that case. He saith unto him, Wouldest thou be made whole? It was a question. He could have laid there. He could have sat there. He could have not moved. It was up to him. Will thou be made whole? And tonight I ask you the same question. Will you be made whole? You can sit here. It's another sermon. Go back upstairs. Yada, yada, yada. Go under the trees at UPS. Whatever. Uh, you know, smoke a square. Hey. Or else say, God, not only do I want to be healed, I want to be whole because I know there's some issues that I've not dealt with because I am not ready to re-engage yet. And I pray that you would make me whole. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here tonight and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that's where it all starts. It's not good people that go to heaven. It's not church people that go to heaven. It's forgiven people. The Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that what? Not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Think about that, not of works. Most of us would think salvation. Well, I've tried to keep the commandments. The Bible says, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The reason God gave us the commandments was not to save us by them, but to show us we needed saving, because I've broken them. It's not good people that go to heaven. If it was, why did Jesus die? It's sinners that are forgiven by the blood of Christ. 
If you're here tonight and say, I want to be forgiven, I want to be saved, Pastor, would you pray for me? Anybody tonight, raise up your hand. I want to pray for you all throughout the auditorium. I want to be forgiven. Hallelujah. This is the night. This is the night. This is the night. Anybody else? This is the night. God wants you to be made whole. With every hand raised, I want you to pray along with me in the quietness of your heart. If, you, if your hand was raised, I want you to pray with me quietly in your heart. I think of the thief on the cross when he was dying. He simply cried out to Jesus and said, Lord, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said before the Son, I said, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. It wasn't the words of his prayer, it was the attitude of his heart. But if you want to truly be saved and trust Christ tonight, I want you to pray in the quietness of your heart something simple. Dear God, I, I know I'm a sinner. I, I know I deserve hell. I've broken your law. But I believe Jesus died for my sin. I believe he died on the cross for me. Forgive me, I receive you as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I pray that you are challenged by that message. And it's our hope that not that you look at these amazing stories and say, boy, wasn't that nice, but for them to challenge you. I, I want to ask you today, are you certain right now if you were to die where you would spend eternity? There really is no more important question. Now think of what Jesus said when he said, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. That's an amazing statement. If you can gain the whole world, that's a lot. But you lose your own soul. The one thing that you have is eternal is your soul. And my question to you is, where are you going for eternity? Most of us would give pet answers like, well, you know, I'm pretty good. Uh, I'm religious or I watch Christian television or I engage with my church and you'll name the denomination and I've tried to keep the commandments and you'll list a, a litany of things that you've done. But I want to tell you today, none of those equate to salvation. The Bible never talks about a specific denomination. That's the first defense that people will give. Are you going to heaven? Well, I'm, I'm Baptist. I'm Catholic. I'm, I'm Pentecostal, I'm, I'm Presbyterian, and they'll, they'll list their church. But the Bible never lists a church or a denomination, so that's irrelevant. How about you? Are you forgiven as a person? If you were to die and stand before a holy, righteous God, are you forgiven? That's what the question is. Because we know that we're all going to die one day, and the Bible says, for as it is appointed unto man once to die, then after this comes the judgment. Powerful verse, think about that. What that means is there is an after this. It's appointed unto man once to die. We know we're gonna die. We see obituaries every day. We've been to funerals. After this. So there's an after this. What is after this judgment? Judgment, judgment of what? Judgment of our sins. You see, we've all sinned. The reason God gave us his commandments was not to save us by them, but to show us we needed saving because the commandments reveal what we really are, and that is sinful. So is after death is judgment? And, and we've sinned and we've all sinned? Well, what's the penalty to sin? The Bible says for the wages of sin. Have you ever worked a job? At the end of a, maybe a two-week period, you get your wages. Wages is what you deserve. If I agreed with my employer, Let's say at the end of two weeks, these are what my wages are going to be. At the end of those two, two weeks, I, I deserve those wages. We agreed upon it. Well, the wages of sin. Who has sinned? All of us. Jesus said, even if you look to lust, you committed adultery. The wages of sin is death. And the second death is the lake of fire. So because God is holy, the penalty to sin is hell. Well, then it means everybody goes to hell. But here's the good news. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to pay that wage. He cried out and said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So you would never have to be forsaken. He died the death that you would never have to die. He paid for your sins. So here's the issue. Either you trust Christ as your sin bearer, the one who died for you, and God pardons you, or you pay for your sins yourself. That's the issue. Either Jesus paid for it or you, you will pay for it. Your choice. But I encourage you today, why don't you trust Jesus to pay for your sins? Why don't you bow your head with me and just pray a simple prayer. Again, prayers don't save you. 
It's you crying out in your soul for God to save you. And God will in faith if you believe on the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why don't you just pray with me? Say something simple. Dear God, I, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve hell. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin. But today I call out to you, save me in Jesus' name. Amen. If you trusted Christ today, why don't you let us know? Why don't you write us? If you just enjoy this program, when we see some of your letters, we are so encouraged because we want to we wanna be here to know that God is doing something in your life. Let us know what he's done through this program. It would be a great, great encouragement to us. God bless you and thank you for watching. Thank you.